All right, this is Robbie Dew interviewing, may you say your name, please? Anthony Prezigian. And it is Friday, March 29th, 2019. How are you doing today? I'm doing terrific, Robbie. Thank you. Yeah. Now, could you tell us when and where you were born? I was born in Salem, Oregon, in July of 1944. So I am a war baby. That's my letters. <laughs> okay. Um, what did your parents do while you were growing up? Uh, my parents were uh, basically in sales. Uh, my father uh, was in the furniture business, and my mother uh, worked in uh, department stores. So they were both in uh, retail. So your mother worked at the time too. Right. Okay. Um, where did you go to school? What can you go us through your academic history? Okay. Well, I grew up in um, Waukegan, Illinois, which is halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee, and that's uh, where I spent my my formative years. And when it came time to uh, selecting uh, college, I was the uh, first attendee in my family to go to, go to college. Uh, I think because I was an only child and my parents were very protective, they uh, pushed me toward going to a small liberal arts college. And I enrolled in Monmouth College in West Central Illinois. It was there that I uh, majored in biology. And that provided me then a springboard to go to graduate school at Indiana University, uh, not in biology, but in biological anthropology. I got my PhD at Indiana University and then uh, moved to UC. Okay. Um, what made you pursue a career in higher education? Did you always know you wanted to be a professor? Well, I. Preparing for this uh, interview, I had a chance to reflect and what were the key triggers in my life. And I was, in fact, reminded of my first week as an undergraduate at Monmouth College when I went to my uh, Biology 101 class and there was a new assistant professor there, Dr. Allison, a professor in that class. And during the course of uh, 101 biology, he took some time out, and he was a freshly minted PhD, and he took the time out uh, to do an um, uh, overview of his PhD research. And he brought to class uh, all of his documents and all of his research papers, and you could see all the steps that he took in his research leading to his PhD and his assistant professorship at Monmouth College. Uh, he was so enthusiastic and when I saw all the steps that he took to get his PhD and the excitement of research, and now standing before a class of undergraduates, I really admired the guy. It was an infectious presentation and it was right then, as a freshman in biology, that I decided, well, I want to be that guy and I want to be a professor someday. So that triggered uh, then um, completing my undergraduate degree and then um, moving on to graduate school. Okay. And what did you write your dissertation on, if you may ask? Oh, okay. Uh, that's another uh, interesting story. My uh, PhD professor at Indiana University was uh, notorious in keeping his graduate students for a long, long time. And I'm talking like uh, five to eight years uh, to complete their PhDs. And I was too impatient for that. And my professor's area of research, uh, his specialty, wasn't exactly my cup of tea. And I can't remember exactly how I struck upon my topic, but I settled on a subject that he didn't have any particular expertise in that would give me some 
latitude to do my thing and graduate in a timely way. <laughs> so uh, his field was uh, looking at relationships among prehistoric Native American populations using uh, skeletons. And so I was steeped in working with uh, prehistoric Native American populations. And uh, I ended up uh, doing my research on osteoporosis, which is a common malady today, especially in postmenopausal women. So the question was, did prehistoric Native American populations in different settings, uh, did they experience what today is a universal phenomenon, bone loss, bone mineral loss uh, with age? Uh, I was very fortunate to have um, uh, linked up with the medical school at uh, Indiana University in Indianapolis, where at the time there was experimental new methodologies for measuring bone mineral in living people, and that was photon absorptiometry. So uh, using uh, iodine isotopes, uh, I was able to pass photons through the radius bone of these prehistoric peoples and very precisely measured bone mineral content, knowing the age and time of death of the person, I could look at the relationship between age and time of death and bone mineral content. Lo and behold, uh, those Native American prehistoric peoples who were able to live into their 40s and 50s underwent the same pattern of bone loss that we do today. So it's kind of a universal phenomenon of, of aging. And here uh, males are clearly at an advantage. They do lose bone at a lower rate than do uh, females. So it was an interesting topic yeah. and, um, and it gave me some freedom to <laughs> get, the, get the project done in a timely way. <laughs> Uh, so I came to uh, UC in 1970, and I had not completed my PhD at the time, okay. and I'll never forget that uh, first year at UC as an assistant professor without my dissertation, but of course plenty of incentive to finish. It was in uh, April of my first year at UC, which was the beginning of spring quarter at the time. I was giving a paper in Boston and I got a call that sadly my advisor died right in the middle of my dissertation. Wow. Uh, fortunately, I had some backup professors on my committee who were able to uh, uh, step in and uh, help me through the ending stages of completing my PhD. So in 71, after my first year at UC, I completed my PhD. That's really cool. Um, so you've come to UC. Was it just they were hiring and you came here, or, or did you know anything about the program or anything like that? Well, my decision-making pro process uh, on UC was um, uh, kind of serendipitous. Uh, I had uh, gone to the national meetings of the American Anthropological Association. This would have been in uh, fall of uh, 69, and I was doing a lot of interviewing. And uh, this was a time of uh, really explosive growth in higher education. Um, we had, our country had re received a real scare from the Russians with Sputnik. And uh, in response, this, there was rapid growth in higher education in college uh, enrollments. And so UC was part of that, and they were, were, were growing. And uh, so uh, I interviewed four or five schools at the meetings, including UC. And as it turns out, uh, even without a PhD, I was getting offers from Oregon State and Brooklyn College in addition to uh, UC. And I liked in particular the, the head of the department, Gustav Carlson, 
I found him uh, an inspiring person, someone I'd like to uh, work with, work for. And so I gravitated toward uh, UC, and in particular I was uh, gravitating to UC because I was looking long range in my career. Uh, where should I start my career? And so I opted for UC because, frankly, it was the closest big university to Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> and it would be my, my stepping stone. So I came in fall of 70, began my career, and uh, lo and behold, Cincinnati uh, grew on me and uh, I stayed for 40 years. Wow. So what uh, jobs did you hold during your time here at UC? Well, that's an uh, interesting uh, question and uh, one we could spend a lot of time on, but uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I, I've had uh, the good fortune of serving in, in many roles at UC. Uh, my early part of my career, I, of course, was 100% uh, professor doing uh, teaching uh, and research, but uh, there were, an opportunity arose in the early 1980s when uh, uh, arts and sciences was undergoing a transition and uh, there was appointed uh, an acting dean. And uh, the acting dean, in fact, uh, a professor of history, all things. <laughs> and uh, he and I were well acquainted and uh, we had a good rapport and he asked me to step in on a temporary basis to be the acting associate dean and uh, I thought well why not uh, it's not a life sentence so uh, I'll give it a I'll give it a go and I wouldn't have to give up my teaching and continue to teach so in the early 80s, I became uh, acting associate dean of arts and sciences. And then uh, that opened up uh, a series of um, developments uh, in administration. Uh, during that time, I became from acting associate dean and became associate dean. And then uh, there was uh, transition going on in the Department of African American Studies or Africana Studies, I believe it's called today. And uh, I was wearing two hats uh, as Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences and Acting Head of Africana Studies. So I did that uh, for a couple years. Uh, then in the early 90s, uh, an opening was created in the Provost's Office Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. And uh, <clears throat> I felt that I had some uh, measure of success as Administrator in Arts and Sciences. So I applied for this Vice Provost position and uh, was selected in 1991 to be Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. I served in that role <clears throat> until December of 1993 when uh, uh, the president uh, of the university, Joseph Steger, uh, who at the time was serving as president and as acting provost, uh, I, I was asked to step in on an emergency basis to be the acting provost. This was in, in fact, December 7th, 1993, a day that Ominous. will be remembered. <laughs> yeah. so, um, I agreed to do this until uh, the summer of uh, 1994, when <clears throat> hopefully the provost search would be completed. I had no interest at all in being provost. <clears throat> well, you never can control things altogether, and uh, the provost search uh, did not go well. In fact, there were a couple fail searches, so I found myself as acting provost uh, until uh, 1996. So I 
served 28 months as uh, acting provost, and then UC hired a provost, and then I went back to my role as uh, as vice provost. Uh, well, as things worked out during that return as vice provost for academic affairs, there was uh, another development in the university where the athletic director was fired. And uh, at the time, I was chairing the NCAA certification self-study for the university. And the president figured, well, I might know something about sports. So uh, with four hours notice, uh, he asked me to be the AD and he wanted a quick decision because the AD had to go and he needed to find a quick replacement. So my life completely turned on its head within four hours as I became the uh, acting athletic director of the University of Cincinnati in 1997. So uh, that was obviously an interesting uh, turn of events and uh, I was in that role for about nine months and had a great time, quite frankly. Uh, then at the end of 1998, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, the provost and the president had a falling out, so to speak. And the president asked me for a second time to be the acting provost. <laughs> so uh, I agreed to do it a second time, but only this time uh, we reached an agreement that if I wish to pursue the job full time, uh, I would have the freedom to do so. So in December of 98, I became uh, provost again, uh, and uh, I applied for the job in 1999, and then in March of 2010, excuse me, in March of uh, 2000, uh, I became the, the provost and was in that position until August of 2010. Wow. So you've been all over the map and... Been all over the administrative uh, map uh, yeah. and for much of the time that I was uh, provost, I continued to teach my uh, survey of physical anthropology or biological anthropology course, uh, but by about 2007, 2008, it became um, too onerous to do everything, and I knew deep down that uh, my students were not getting all of me, mm -hmm. and uh, so I um, stopped teaching in, uh, in 2007. Okay. Let's um, type the one here. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you've told us a little bit about your time in the administration, uh, your time as a teacher. What can you tell us a little about your time there? Are there are colleagues that stand out in your mind. You've mentioned a few already, mm -hmm. um, and then what sort of differences were there yeah. between being in the academic department and in the administrative side yeah. of things? Well, uh, when I came to UC in 1970 and began my professorial uh, career uh, it was a different culture uh, at the time and I was sort of brought up in a culture that uh, students should appreciate professors, they should respect professors, they should follow the professors, they should listen to the professors and our uh, only obligation was that we would go to class we would do our thing and deliver our material, and the students could take it or leave it. And they were just fortunate to have us in their presence. Uh, but uh, that was in 1970 and for many years uh, thereafter. But the university uh, changed and uh, relationships between professors and students changed. And during my time at UC, uh, what evolved 
was uh, a partnership where professors and students shared equally in the responsibility for the teaching and learning environment. So uh, as the years unfolded and as I became more plugged into trends in higher education, uh, I began to appreciate the importance of assessment. Assessment not only at the level of the classroom, the class, but assessment at the programmatic level as well. So uh, toward the end of my time uh, teaching, I try to use as many devices as possible to ensure a partnership with the students, that things were flowing uh, profitably in the classroom. So I opted to use the so-called five-minute uh, essay. So uh, at least two or three times a week, um, I would stop five minutes early at the end of my class and ask the students to do a five-minute essay where they would uh, scribble down, uh, one, what was the most interesting thing that happened in class today, and two, what was the least understandable thing <laughs> that happened in class today. And that was a treasure trove of information, getting feedback on how the class went that day. And it was always illuminating to see uh, where I thought I was crystal clear, but where the students were completely befuddled and didn't follow uh, how the class uh, how the class was going on. So I, uh, uh, during my time uh, as a professor, became more invested into classroom assessment, and then as an administrator involved with the accreditation of the university. I began to appreciate even more the importance of um, assessment at the program level, uh, where it's incumbent upon us as uh, professors, as departments, to set clearly defined goals for our majors and to assess the outcomes of that work at the graduation level to see if our graduates have realized uh, the student learning outcomes and goals, and if not, uh, what kind of changes do we make in what we teach and how we teach to ensure that uh, the learning objectives uh, learning objective objectives are met. So uh, that was, I think, uh, a change in my philosophy and in my orientation to become more student responsive more student uh, engaged at both the department at the program level and at the classroom level as well. Uh, and during uh, my time at UC, uh, it was very refreshing to see UC moving more and more toward the use of technology in the classroom. I can't say that uh, I was an active participant as I moved on to administration, but uh, uh, clearly, that was a major development in the teaching and learning environment uh, at UC. You, sp you speak very fondly of a lot of these developments, and obviously there's... There's uh, many others. Yeah, there's uh, both positives and negatives to every kind of change, but you right. seem to... Would you agree that you view most of these changes as positive oh, for the yeah. university? Oh, yeah. Uh, as I look from, the again, the vantage of the, my 40 years, uh, I'm particularly proud that uh, I was part of an administration in the mid-1990s that was really visionary. And uh, in fact, I want to give uh, some very explicit, cre explicit credit to Joseph Steger. Uh, his legacy for most people was primarily the building renaissance, uh, the incredible development architecturally of the university. But what doesn't get enough credit, and here I think I want to give myself credit as, as his provost, that uh, we recognized, he in particular, where higher education was going. Uh, 
1994, the state directed all the universities to author functional mission statements. The state wanted to make sure that we had our act together, and that we were a, a function, a functioning system. And so one step toward that was to look at yourself as an institution and articulate your functional mission statement. Uh, who are you? What are you? What are your uh, priorities? And uh, Dr. Steger was uh, almost uh, unilateral in writing that. He didn't go through a comprehensive process of engagement with everybody, but he, he kind of authored the university's functional mission statement. But it was truly visionary as we, we look back. And we recognized four trajectories for higher education. One was globalization or internationalization. So the university took active steps to create an office of international affairs. That turned out to be a brilliant move in terms of where higher ed was going. President Steger recognized that uh, higher education to stay vibrant and to stay engaged and to stay productive needed to be interdisciplinary. It was sort of a standing joke in higher education that the world has problems and how do universities respond? Well, they respond by creating these silos called academic departments as if anthropology is going to solve all the problems of the world or biology or history or philosophy. So in the mid-90s, higher education was becoming more interdisciplinary. So solutions to problems are complex. Problems are complex. So you have to bring multiple disciplines. So interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity became the watchwords of higher education. UC was ahead of the curve in terms of this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. So globalization, multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. In addition, uh, technology, uh, UC was ahead of the curve in recognizing the importance of technology in the classroom. And the fourth uh, pillar was pedagogy, putting teaching and learning, bridging that together. Until then, we all only spoke about effective teaching. We only talked about teaching, but never the outcome of it, learning. And so I'll never forget uh, a sentence in our functional mission statement where President Steger quipped, UC will be a place where students can't not learn. And uh, That's good. That, <laughs> that was pretty good. And so that became the, the guiding motif into the into the next century and I feel very proud to have um, been part of the administration's thrust around that and as pros, provost uh, that became my guiding motif in terms of executing my work in terms of evaluating programs evaluating professors uh, evaluating the university and the like that's really cool um, so you've sort of touched on a, a number of them, but what would you say some of your more memorable experiences, uh, specific examples of something that you were involved in that you're particularly proud of, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, could you get into maybe one or two of those examples? Well, uh, I wish I could uh, start with a, a graphic academic uh, example, but uh, I, I have to say when the uh, acting athletic director position fell in my lap, uh, that was uh, one of the more interesting experiences uh, in my uh, in my career uh, at UC, and uh, it uh, obviously raised a lot of eyebrows in, in the community. Not the least of which, uh, one of the current. Uh, columnist at the Cincinnati Enquirer, Paul Doherty, who is still very active today. And I remember uh, 
he was uh, at the press conference when my appointment was announced. And uh, the next day he wrote a column about this anthropologist who is now the athletic, athletic director. And he made a joke about, well, I don't know how long he's going to be in that role, but we hope he doesn't forget everything he ever knew about Neanderthals. <laughs> so, so uh, at any rate, uh, I think that acting athletic uh, uh, director position was uh, one, of the, one of the more uh, memorial, uh, one of the more memorable ones uh, for me. Uh, another particular honor for me uh, at the university, if I can be immodest for a moment, uh, one of the thrills for me was uh, getting the Oscar Schmidt Public Service Award. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, university had, uh, well, we've always had awards for teaching and uh, research and student engagement, but the university implemented uh, an award for public service. And one wouldn't normally think that uh, an anthropologist uh, uh, in arts and sciences would get the public service award, but uh, I had spent uh, many, many years uh, serving as a consultant at the Hamilton County Coroner's Office uh, as a forensic anthropologist. So I was particularly proud to get the Public Service Award for my work at the Hamilton County Coroner's Office. That's really cool. What do you think, you've mentioned that UC was ahead of the curve and, yeah. and, and it's changing in, in the vision is, the visionaries yeah. that have been leading it, but what do you think really makes UC stand out as an academic institution? Well, uh, UC in, in many ways is comparable to many other schools, but uh, if we were to highlight uh, its strengths, uh, its cachet in higher education, not to come across as just too cliche, but uh, I think if you were to try to distinguish or characterize UC, I think you have to start with its, uh, its comprehensiveness. Uh, we are a comprehensive public research uh, university, and so I think that uh, it doesn't distinguish us necessarily from a great many peer institutions, but it does uh, accurately uh, define us and establish us as a major player in uh, American higher education. So stepping down or, or stepping away from just the observation of our uh, comprehensiveness, uh, I think you have to obviously note that uh, we are a place where there are academic strengths and traditionally we've had very strong professional programs. As everyone knows, uh, co-op was founded at the University of Cincinnati in 1906. And so in 2006, when we celebrated the centennial of co-op, that was really a big deal. So co-op, I think, renders us uh, as a distinct and distinguished uh, university. So we have uh, many traditional strengths when we look at our top ten programs uh, nationwide or, or internationally. It's very distinctive. Uh, our strengths uh, in medicine, our strengths in engineering, our strengths in music, uh, our strengths in uh, classics. We have uh, strengths across the board in the humanities and social sciences, across the life sciences or STEM disciplines. So I, I think uh, our, our professional programs are uh, very distinctive and uh, bring considerable strength to us. And of course, I'd be uh, remiss in not identifying athletics uh, uh, as well. Uh, we, I think, tend to forget the connection between uh, athletics and academics, 
but in uh, my time in uh, the athletics department, I learned that the athletes at UC perform at levels equal to or surpass non-athlete students at UC. So the teaching and learning environment at UC is um, greatly uh, accentuated through the athletic uh, programs. And I think uh, UC has always been a, a diverse institution, proudly speaking. And uh, I know that um, our international enrollments uh, have grown. Uh, and I think UC can look proudly uh, at that, both, both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level, the proliferation, the growth of international students. I'm in particular proud, in terms of uh, our distinctiveness, to note that uh, we've been leading edge, leading edge, cutting edge, in terms of uh, online learning. Uh, I think we were really ahead of most of the other public research universities in, in Ohio in advancing towards uh, online programs, including online degree programs. Just. As you look back at your time here, and, and from what I'm hearing as you're describing all this, would you say it's fair, what it's, what is, is it fair to say that you hold a lot of love for the institution, that this place is a special place in your heart? Oh, uh, I kind of bleed black and red. Uh, I'm a bear cat uh, for life. Uh, I exude pride for the institution. I'm proud to say that uh, my two children uh, attended UC. Uh, my daughter uh, completed her uh, degree in arts and sciences and economics. And my son uh, came to UC and uh, attended the College of Law where he graduated. And my daughter uh, also attended the College of Law and uh, graduated. So UC and my family, uh, it's a family affair uh, to be sure and so I, I do look quite proudly and fondly and uh, on my 40 years at UC and as it turns out uh, my connection with UC has uh, turned to turn out to be very different uh, as a professor emeritus in that I now work for another university the future university in Egypt. Um, when I retired in uh, 2010, I uh, moved to Egypt, uh, in, actually in December of 2010, and lived there uh, for five years uh, working with the future university in Egypt, FUE. And uh, in 2013, uh, the future university in Egypt engaged in a formal, began a formal partnership with the University of Cincinnati. This was in the fall of 2013. And so i very proud of that, obviously, that my Egyptian university was now a formal partner with my former employer, the University of Cincinnati. And in 2018, the five-year partnership between UC and FUE became uh, renewed. President Pinto uh, visited FUE in November of 2018 and signed a renewal of the agreement uh, for five more years. So very gratified and proud of my home institution and my new institution in terms of this very productive partnership. And again, hearkening back that UC has an international agenda and has a very important footprint in the Middle East, uh, no more so than in the so-called capital of the Middle East, in Cairo. That's really cool. Is, I guess just in closing, is there anything you want to say that I didn't ask? Any You already gave a shout out to one president and anyone else you want to thank? or say it's okay if you don't just any final thoughts yeah uh, well uh, final thoughts um, again reflecting on the uh, big picture uh, when I arrived at UC 
in uh, fall of 1970. We were a respectable institution. We were a municipal university, part municipally supported and part state supported. Uh, as the 1970s unfolded, uh, that changed dramatically and decisively when in the late 70s we became fully state supported. That was a big deal. Another big deal was that uh, the university faculty unionized in the late 70s uh, and uh, between going full state and unionized faculty, major uh, developments uh, to be sure. And as the 80s, 90s and early 2000s unfolded, UC underwent incredible incredible transition from being, uh, I would describe as a regional university, to a key major player as a comprehensive public research uh, university ranked in, two, for, in the top 200 in the world. And so I think uh, UC and its emeriti uh, should feel justly proud being part of that transition, becoming a public research university without ever shirking its responsibility uh, to its students. That's really great. All right, well, thank you so much for sitting okay, down and talking about this.